this is actually quite a basic talk. There's not a lot going on in one sense. The ideas are not particularly um, proof theoretically complicated, but um, it's, I think, important. Uh, it's been helpful, at least for me, to work through these issues to get my ideas uh, clarified about the different way that different forms of rules, both in natural deduction and the sequent calculus, and here, I'm only going to basically be talking about intuitionist and classical um, natural deduction and the sequent calculus, but some of the ideas will uh, straightforwardly uh, transpose to systems like you know, multiplicative and uh, full linear logic, but I won't be looking at the substructural questions here. Um, interesting questions about how uh, different uh, collections and forms of rules might define concepts in the odd case uh, of uh, defining a particular you know, binary predicate, the identity predicate. So my aim here is to just explore the relationships between different rules for an identity predicate, um, looking at things in at least two perspectives, the perspective of natural deduction and the perspective of the sequent calculus and how they, how they relate. So um, the talk has got four sections, roughly, where first I'm actually not going to talk about identity, actually I'm only going to talk about identity in the second half, we're going to set some things up. Uh, the second half is the larger half, but in the first half we'll just look at the relationship between the secant calculus and natural deduction, both in the intuitionist and in the classical uh, context. Then we'll look at different ways that uh, rules for connectives and quantifiers might be thought to define concepts and relationships between different forms of those rules. Then we'll look at uh, rules that define identity, and then we'll look at the relationship between uh, rules for identity and treating identity up um, in the axioms of a sequence system and what that means and how that difference is really sort of manifest uh, when you view things from the perspective of sequent derivations. And it's not so obvious uh, when you look at the rules, uh, or when you look at the things corresponding to those axioms uh, in a natural deduction setting. So that's the, that's the map. So in the first section, I'll just talk about sequent calculus and natural deduction. And this is, you know, if you're here in a proof theory seminar, it should be fairly obvious to you that one way to understand a sequent derivation of a sequent uh, in the intuitionist setting uh, from a bunch of formulas on the left, X and a concluding formula A, you can see that sequent derivation as building some kind of proof from X to A, from the assumption of X to the conclusion A. Uh, it's fun to see this uh, worked out in an example. Uh, at least I like doing that. Uh, apparently, I procrastinate by uh, typesetting derivations and making them animate uh, and things. So you'll get to endure it here. What you've got in the bottom is a natural deduction proof, which if you look at the uh, the conclusion is indeed uh, P and not Q implies R, and the only undischarged assumption is P implies Q or R, and indeed that's the concluding sequence, uh, concluding sequence of the derivation in the sequence calculus. You can see uh, wherever we've got a you know, disjunction, a rule on the left uh, that corresponds to elimination rule. Uh, so we've got that disjunction left, disjunction elimination, conditional left, conditional elimination, and so on. And the right rules correspond to uh, the introduction rules, as you'd expect. Uh, but more than that, um, you can see the derivation as a way of building up from not from the top to the bottom, but in some sense from the inside out, uh, this um, natural deduction proof. So if you step through this, you can look at the first uh, sequence here from Q to Q. Uh, that kind of, if you zoom in, that corresponds to the little tiny atomic proof of Q from the assumption Q. Uh, when we go to the next step from Q and not Q uh, to the empty right-hand side, that corresponds to this little uh, proof inside here, which goes from Q and not Q to the, in this case, I'm just using uh, the sharp as a, a symbol, not as a formula, but as a kind of punctuation mark, uh, which 
gets put in conclusion position for a, a refutation uh, uh, thought of natural deduction wise as just a, a refutation of the assumptions. Uh, if you like, you could replace this with a Folsom symbol and think of that as a connective, but thinking of it as a punctuation mark is kind of nice for the separability of all of the rules. And then, uh, well, what's this here? I decided to represent weakening uh, as a rule rather than as uh, something that goes on in the axioms. And in the, you know, that corresponds to, uh, you know, weakening in from having a derivation of a contradiction, a, a, a refutation of the assumptions to saying, okay, uh, from that we can conclude an arbitrary conclusion, that's R, which is a step of weakening. Uh, you could think of that as the ex falso quad libet or falsum elimination rule, if you like. Uh, so that's uh, this sequence corresponds to that proof. And you can keep going on, uh, you know, you've got the proof of R, uh, from R, which corresponds to this little bit, and you combine them together in a, a disjunctive elimination now uh, with QRR as an assumption. So now we're just thinking of the QRR, the proof from QRR and not Q to R. So there's our little disjunctive syllogism, and you can build it up again and again and again. Uh, corresponds to not only the natural deduction proof, but if you like, the natural deduction proof with a bunch of sort of uh, to think of them as the analogue of tree rings, as we're sort of building up this thing from the inside out uh, in this case. So it's not only the natural deduction proof thought of as a static object, but the development of the natural deduction proof over time or as it's built up, not from the top to the bottom, but from some process of inside out. And the neat thing about this, uh, one way of understanding the kind of redundancy that you have in the sequent calculus is that this relationship is many to one. Uh, any sequent derivation uh, generates a proof, uh, but different sequent derivations can generate the same proof. And here we've got a different way of building up. If you just do this again and again, you just read this process, it's also producing the same proof, but we've permuted some rules around the place. Oh, and by the way, we've got a cut in the middle here. So if you can see here, we've got once here this proof from P implies QRR, P and QRR. And uh, here we've got QRR, uh, not Q and R. So this QRR, actually, I'll do this with the pen. This QRR and this not Q uh, gives us R is just this sort of sub proof uh, inside. And then the cut corresponds to uh, sort of pasting together these two proofs. So the cut being a separate rule in the sequent calculus, in natural deduction, that's just composition of proofs. There's no, in, you know, Genson private style natural deduction, there's nothing marking a cut. Uh, it's just a possible site of a reduction. Uh, whereas if you build, um, you know, proofs without, uh, if you build proofs using cut free uh, derivation, then you're going to produce a normal proof. Uh, as you can see, you just work through all of the details. So this relationship is nice and sweet uh, in the intuitionist setting. It's a classical standard sort of classical sequence calculus. Here's some uh, classically uh, derivable, but um, intuitionistically underivable sequence, uh, like excluded middle and Peirce's, Peirce's law uh, here in this case. Uh, they don't build uh, natural deduction derivations. And you can think of them as building sort of natural deduction derivations where we've got to use negation to kind of encode uh, the extra, the, the presence of the extra formulas on the right hand side, thereby doing some you know, negation translation or something like that. And that's a perfectly acceptable thing to do, but you lose the kind of separability properties uh, that you uh, have got here, both in terms of the sort of subformula property in the um, sequent, in the, you know, cut-free sequent derivations. And it's kind of nice to know that actually you can think about what these classical derivations build. Uh, if you, uh, by not moving very far away from the situation in natural deduction, if you add focus, um, if you add a particular kind of focus, there's been a lot of interesting work of, you know, polarized and focused sequence here, we're going to use very little of the kind of technology of uh, blessing a particular position in a multiple premise, multiple conclusion sequence, because what the position that we're always going to bless is always going to be in the right hand side we're going to single out a single formula on the right hand side or possibly no formulas on the right hand side single out if especially if there's no formula there if it's just the empty right hand side you can't 
put a formula there to, to single out. But this, the reason for this is so that the proofs that we are constructing still kind of look like natural deduction proofs where you've got assumptions and you've got a conclusion or a refutation marker. But if you add these to the sequence calculus, um, you could think of a focused sequence as having a shape, a bunch of premises, a bunch of assumptions, uh, conclusion C, and then what are the other things on the right-hand side? Well, you could think of those things as also kind of assumptions, but they're just assumptions held negatively, uh, where instead of uh, asserting their negations, what you're doing is just denying the Y and asserting the X, ruling the X's in, ruling the Y's out, or granting the X's positively, uh, granting the Y's negatively, and deriving C on the basis of that context. So there's a little tiny bit of bilateralism there for those of you that have been following that kind of discussion about bilateralism. But the, the neat kind of thing uh, that you construct here, if you think of these sort of sequent calculi where you single out a single formula on the right hand side and just modify the rules appropriately for this, you get an already well understood kind of natural deduction setting. What you get is uh, Michel Parajot's lambda mu calculus, but just understood in natural deduction. So one way of thinking about this is a sequent uh, what we want to be able to do is to move this focus guy around. Uh, you know, you want to consider this formula that you've got in the spotlight as being the conclusion. We want to be able to, you know, possibly move some other formula into the conclusion, concluding position, just as a purely structural rule. And one way to do this in a natural deduction setting is to represent, you know, here is a proof which has got nothing in the conclusion. So that's the contradiction. But this I formula here is one of these things which is an assumption, but it's an assumption which is held negatively. So I'll just understand assumptions that are held negatively as leaves of a tree in just the same way that the other assumptions are, but I'll just tag it with a minus to indicate that it's held negatively. And I will just, the, well, there'll be this rule, which will be called the focusing rule, sort of natural deduction in the sequent calculus, which can take something which is out of focus and put it into focus. Well, you can think of that in natural deduction as taking something which was one of your negative assumptions and making it, uh, you know, retrieving it from that store of negative assumptions and putting it in the focus as a conclusion. And now it's no longer marked negatively. And you can see how, you know, just tagging this with a negation gives you a, a kind of negation translation or, you know, an extra negation sort of reductio move uh, here. Uh, well, that's putting something in the focus. And uh, how do you uh, take something out of the focus uh, to get a, a, a sequence without focus? Well, if I've got this proof, uh, which has got A in the conclusion. And so, you know, X are the sort of positive assumptions of the proof pi and Y are the existing negative assumptions of the proof pi. Well, how do I um, take A out of focus? Well, let's just add A as a negative conclusion. Oh, sorry, negative assumption. You know, just assume that you don't have A uh, or rule A out. Well, if you've ruled A out and you've already proved A, well, then you've reduced everything to a contradiction. So that's how you get the contradiction. And so here, a, a really nice thing uh, to see is that one way to understand uh, Parajot's lambda mu calculus, which is all that this is, is a small structural addition to standard Gens and private style natural deduction, which gives you uh, correspondence with the classical sequence calculus uh, with focus. So this is a little bit new, so I'll spend a little bit of time sort of doing this. Here's now an explanation of how you can get a kind of natural deduction proof of uh, corresponding to the derivation of Hessen's law. So here, you start off with your atomic sequence, which is just, um, you know, this assumption of P. And P is in the conclusion, it's in the, uh, it's the positive assumption, and there it is. And then we can move the P out of focus. So what we have there is this positive assumption and negative assumption where, you know, I've just contradicted myself, ruling P in and ruling P out. And therefore I'm, you know, there's nothing left. I've reduced that to absurdity. And then uh, here's another way of understanding 
uh, the weakening on the right rule. Uh, a neat thing of understanding the weakening on the right rule in this context is that this is um, retrieving from the storage the formula Q, which was assumed here zero times. So it's actually explicitly a kind of weakening, which corresponds in natural deduction to uh, vacuously discharging assumptions, discharging an occurrence of an assumption which isn't there, discharging an assumption which occurs zero times. This shows that the, the rule which we've understood in one sense is natural deduction as just you know, from a contradiction, you can um, infer anything. It's actually an instance of the retrieval rule that we saw um, here, where the occurrence just is, you know, occurring zero times. So this corresponds exactly to the kind of weakening on the left-hand side, which in Genson Pravitz style natural deduction is just done in terms of allowing, you know, zero occurrences uh, for discharge, for, you know, a way to add from sort of linear natural deduction to you know relevant uh, uh from linear or relevant natural deduction to affine or, or intuitionist natural deduction so it's all nicely of a piece there uh so that's that so now we've got q as our conclusion so we have this uh, proof from the assumption p to the conclusion q where p is also held negatively that corresponds to that bit of the proof but now we can, you know, discharge the assumption, the positive assumption of P to get P implies Q holding from P held negatively, which corresponds to this sequent, where the P implies Q, the P conditional Q is in focus, and the uh, P also on the right hand side is understood as the, the kind of context where it's held negatively. Then in the sequent derivation, uh, this is where we introduce uh, uh, another p-sequent, which corresponds to this point, point in the natural deduction, because when we introduce the conditional on the, sorry, when we introduce the conditional on the left in this rule, that corresponds to, you know, pasting together this p uh, with p implies q implies p and uh, this proof here. So we get this uh, large assumption of the conditional with a conditional antecedent, uh, the P negative on as the other assumption and the P positive as the conclusion. And now, you know, if I'm thinking of things just without focus, I discharge, I, I contract these two occurrences of P into one. Uh, now, I really do have two separate occurrences here because one's in a conclusion and one's a sort of a negative assumption. So just doing this with the natural deduction rules that we have, that corresponds to moving one of these P's out of focus. So again, making another negative assumption to give us a contradiction and uh, then discharging them both at the one time um, to retrieve it. And for some reason in these slides, I've written that as Q when it should obviously have been P. Sorry about that. So that's the, uh, a, a way of seeing these as building natural deduction sorts of proofs where, again, the relationship between classical and intuitionist uh, natural deduction is just thought of as the addition of extra structural rules uh, rather than the behavior of extra, uh, extra rules, uh, non-separable rules that can actives. And so this is a, gives you a well-behaved normalizing natural deduction system for classical logic, which Michel Parajo, you know, invented 20 years ago. And so you can interpret sequence with focus as uh, generating a proof of a conclusion from a context where uh, now we're thinking of some things in the context being asserted positively and negatively. This corresponds to the different uh, kinds of variables in the lambda mu calculus. And these are the uh, terms, these are the special, special mu terms, uh, which are just refutations where there's no formula in focus yet. Uh, where you're moving from one formula being in focus into another. And you can think of that as a refutation of the context. And when I'm considering identity, I'm just going to use that background to freely pass between sequent derivations now and natural deduction proofs, where if I'm doing this in the classical context, I'm just imagining that I've got this extra stuff uh, in the background, uh, which will just allow me to do this sort of classically and intuitionistically. So that's that's the background. Defining rules. Uh, what makes these 
uh, logical rules well behaved. This is an issue that people have had for many years. Uh, you know, Arthur Pryor raised the wonderful question, um, why should we think of these rules as somehow being analytically valid uh, when these rules are obviously insane? They're rules. Uh, surely what makes rules analytically valid cannot just be that they're given by fiat. And so you get this lovely question in Pryor's, um, you know, runabout inference ticket paper where he says, you know, what, what, what does it take for something to be analytic, analytically valid? Well, one option for something to be true in virtue of meaning is for it to count as a definition. And, and sometimes you see this uh, as talked about, you know, these conjunction rules, they define the meaning of and proof theoretically, or maybe one of them, like the introduction of the elimination rules really defines the meaning and you sort of generate the other ones from that. And that's a totally uh, useful way to go. Um, but it looks like the and I and the Andy rules themselves don't look much like definitions. They look like, um, you know, desiderata or hopes or analyses of a meaning that was given in some other kind of way. Whereas invertible rules, whatever they do, they kind of look a little bit more like definitions. They're equivalences for one thing. They look a little bit like, okay, the stuff on one side of the line is defined in terms of the stuff on the other side of the line. And so, you know, these sorts of rules, which have been discussed at least since Dana Scott, um, reference in the, you know, back of the slides, if you want to, you want to follow things and been looked in, uh, looked at in depth by, you know, hacking and Kostradoshin and, you know, many other people over the years, these sorts of invertible rules, they're, they're kind of like um, sort of stipulative definitions where I take something, you can imagine the things below the line as being additions to a vocabulary and the things above the line are how the things are defined in terms of that. But they're sort of weird because they're not like, uh, you know, rewrite definitions, which say here's whenever you see the term, this term, uh, rewrite it in terms of that term, because they only characterize one aspect of the behavior of the in introduced concept. You know, the and rule says, here's how and uh, works on the left hand side of the sequent, or here's how and works as uh, an assumption. Here's how you prove a conditional. That's what the uh, conditional uh, rule, invertible rule says. It doesn't say anything about how conditional uh, works on the left-hand side of the sequence and so on. Uh, if you're going to treat that as a definition, you've got to say that the structural rules, the things which connect the left, in particular identity and cut, which connect the left-hand side and the right-hand side of a sequence, or the fact that we take an atomic proof to just be a proof where the thing which is the assumption is a conclusion, they're the things which are connecting what's going on the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Now, the sweet thing is that these defining rules really define, they're conservative and uniquely defining, but also from those things, and I'm going to explain why, um, they're uniquely defining because um, like a stipulative, like, you know, rewrite definitions are, because for example, uh, if I, you know, introduce an and using this rule and you introduce something that you call and using a rule that has that shape, then my and and your and are obviously going to be equivalent because we can pass from mine to yours on the left-hand side just through uh, the decomposition uh, from A and B on the left-hand side decomposing into the constituents and so on for the others. So they're clearly uniquely defining using- uh, Sorry, uh, we have a question now. Oh, do we? Good. Uh, in the chat, so should yep. the from uh, Revanta Ramana, Ramanaya. Yep. Uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I put it in the chat, but just a very quick, yeah. uh, the, uh, in the invertible rules, uh, you say, of course, it's not capturing everything about the conjunction. But Absolutely. Should, should, uh, shouldn't, the invert, shouldn't that first rule be seen as defining the comma rather than- Oh yeah, conjunction? that, uh, of course, you might, you might think that. Um, uh, and that's why, for example, uh, thinking about the relationship between the sequent calculus and natural deduction and the interpretation of what a natural deduction proof is doing, uh, you might think that in a natural deduction proof, it's just a proof from these premises to that conclusion. And so uh, it's that, uh, it's something else, namely, I am uh, taking this assumption together with that assumption and that it's that kind of taking together, uh, which is defining the behavior of the comma. So I'm thinking of these rules as the things that are below the line are uh, being 
uh, understood as ways of introducing uh, the thing below the line as vocabulary in terms of a pre-existing vocabulary that's understood above the line. There's much more that can be said about that, uh, but that's that's the the, the kind of uh, space in which these sorts of explanations are being given. But yeah, okay. if you don't know what the comma means, then this is not going to help. Absolutely, yeah. uh, but that's one reason to to pay attention to the relationship between the sequent calculus and natural deduction, because in natural deduction, it's um, another because uh, it's an you know that's where. You, you might find an answer to say that, you know, what's that comma? Well, it's whatever we're counting uh, as, you know, this premise together with that premise together with that premise in a proof. And then I've got to tell you something about what a proof is and what counts as a proof and et cetera, and what sort of structural rules govern proofs and so on. Yeah, so, but good questions. Um, so yeah, uh, but the neat thing, uh, which has been noticed a number of times, uh, is that you can get from these invertible rules to the left-right rules. Uh, the invertible uh, rule for conjunction gives you the standard multiplicative left rule for conjunction, and you can get the right rule for conjunction just by taking an ident using identity and cut and nothing else. So here's the identity uh, sequent, and uh, then you unpack the identity sequent using the defining rule, and then use a couple of cuts to generalize on that uh, the spots on the left where the A and the B are occurring. And if you look at this derivation that you get and just focus on what's left, you get the multiplicative right rule. Uh, and you can also use the left and the right rules together with cut and identity to get the in the other half of the invertible rule back. So there's a very tight connection between the invertible rules and the left-right rules uh, in the context of these things. Neat thing too is that whenever you do this with any kind of natural uh, defining rule which satisfies the subformula property in this kind of context, is that a left-right rules which which is given by that uh, translation that I was giving, and that's purely algorithmic, uh, will admit the elimination of principal cuts. Because if you just look at a principal cut on the right and the left rule like this, you just, uh, one of these is just going to be the defining rule, and the other one, you just sort of rewrite that in terms of the other defining rule that you have, and so it's a big, ugly mess. But when you then look at this, you'll see you've got three cuts in a row a cut, a cut, and a cut, and you just permute this bottom cut above uh, the two uh, cuts that were above it, the two blue ones, and then you have this little constellation uh, here, which is an identity rule, a defining rule in one direction, a defining rule in the other direction cut together, and that always uh, returns you back to where you were before, and if you're happy to say that that reduces um, to, uh, you know, the little if that reduces, this is kind of like an ADA expansion. Uh, if you think of that as reducing to the, you know, identity little bit of derivation, uh, then this just corresponds to the standard uh, reduction of the multiplicative cut. And that actually happens all the time for all of the propositional connectives or quantifiers. Same sort of uh, reasoning happens. But have a look at uh, what uh, this looks like in natural deduction. The defining rule that you get here is not the standard, you know, Genson Private's natural deduction rule. This is the, you know, multiplicative natural deduction rule. If you think of this as saying, if I've got a proof from A and B, where X and Z is the other stuff, and so C I've just focused on is the formula that's in the conclusion, and the other assumptions up there are X and the remainder of Z, then we can trade that in for a proof where A and B are no longer active, so you discharge them and replace them by the conjunction A and B. And that corresponds to the multiplicative natural reduction rule. Uh, whereas um, this uh, left rule, uh, the defining rule in the other direction corresponds to the introduction rule, but the one way of thinking about this is that this is operative at the top of a proof. So you can think of this as sort of uh, going from A and B uh, being used here, 
uh, as an assumption. And now we are replacing that A and B with the A and the B used as an assumption. Whereas if you look at the standard uh, left rule in the sequent calculus, it's rather combining a proof of A and a proof of B into a proof of A and B, which merges together the two proofs, which is rather looking at this same fragment of proof, but thinking of that as built from uh, the proofs being built from above and being you know, constructed at the bottom. So two different ways of looking at this little kind of join here. Um, now, uh, the neat thing about this is that you get uh, cut elimination in the subformula property. Uh, if you've got the subformula property for rules other than cut, you get conservative extension from these defining rules. So, and the shape of the defining rules, like I sketched, gives you uniqueness. Just want to point you to the, the, the only distinctive behavior with here with the quantifiers. Here's an invertible rule for the quantifier, provided that n is absent from the lower sequent and is not an, uh, is not an arbitrary or it cannot be just any term because you might have terms which have got distinctive deductive power like function terms, for example. You wouldn't say that in a, you know, the language of arithmetic, um, you know, if you, proved some, that something held of the successor of X than it held of everything, because it's not going to necessarily hold of everything, it's just going to hold of every successor. But if you've got terms which are inferentially general, like the eigenvariables or constants, uh, then this is an invertible rule for the universal quantifier. And well, how do you do the inversion of this to get the standard left rule? Uh, for the quantifier, because if you just look at one direction, you're not going to get uh, on the identity uh, sequence, you're not going to get from everything's F to T is F, you're just going to get from everything's F to N is F. So you need to, in this context where you've got uh, these invertible rules, you need to admit uh, another rule, a structural rule here, but it's a whole sort of global sequent transformation rule, which says that if you can prove something where you've got a totally general term, you can specialize it into any specific term that's of that syntactic category. And we're going to see this uh, when it comes to the identity rules uh, in a tick. And that actually just uh, is a rule that has this kind of shape. In the literature, the first thing that I've seen this in a rule of this form in a sequent calculus is in a paper by Arne and Avron uh, from the eight. Oh, it's in the references. It'd be interesting if anybody has seen uh, 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 a rule of this form in the literature any earlier than that. I've not, not seen that. But spec, uh, like idea and cut, are primitive rules uh, in the system if you've got defining rules. But then when you replace the defining rule by a left and right rule of the standard kind, then you can show that spec no longer needs to be a, a, a separate rule. It's actually height preserving admissible. Uh, with the standard rules. And I'm not going to go through that because I want to spend the rest of the time talking about identity. Okay. Uh, I'm uh, going off some uh, um, uh, thoughts and uh, arguments of my uh, soon to be colleague, Steve Reed, um, uh, on identity and harmonious. Yes, uh, uh, so there is, some, uh, there is another question here. Uh, is in spec just the substitution rule? Yeah. Yeah. It. Yeah. And it's so. It is. It's. It's doing a substitution from a more general term to a more specific term, and yeah, it's a global substitution on sequence. And it's exactly. So it's what I was curious about is have there been sort of cal uh, sequence style calculi where that's actually uh, never just noticed that uh, that this is admissible, uh, but is treated as a primitive rule uh, in the sequence calculus. It's certainly not there in Gensen. Um, so, so that'd be nice to know, uh, but it is, but I'm, I'm thinking of it as a, a particular kind of substitution where I'm thinking of it as you're moving from a more general term to a term which may be more specific. Because uh, the special thing about the, the term N in this case is that it's inferentially general, uh, which means that, you know, anything which holds of it, any inference which holds of it, holds of any other terms of that category. Um, yeah, good question. Um, so, um, Steve, one way of thinking about, you know, Steve's proposal about identity can be sort of formatted in this format as a defining rule. Uh, but now it's treating the predicate F as being sort of inferentially general, rather than thinking of a, a name uh, or an eigenvariable as the term which is inferentially general. So the idea is that 
to prove that A is identical to B, you want to show how you can transfer any feature of A into being the feature of B and vice versa. Um, on the other hand, to distinguish A and B, you want to find some feature or at least posit that there is some feature that A has that B doesn't have. Um, yeah, that's just what I said. Uh, yeah, that's just what I said. So identity turns out to be a kind of indistinguishability. And when you think of this sequence calculus wise, if you look at those rules in, this is now a two premise um, invertible rule. And so what that means, uh, a two premise invertible rule says if the conclusion is derivable, then you know both of the premises are. So when I invert them, I get two rules like this, uh, which look fairly familiar as identity rules as they are, but now we've got this special case where the F again is not just any predicate, but is one of these inferentially uh, general predicates. When you look at that in terms of natural deduction, you get what is you know obvious. If I have a proof of A is, that A is identical to B, and I have a proof, uh, and and I not if I have a proof of F A, but in this particular case, if I grant F A as an extra assumption, then I can conclude F B. So this is the specific case where if I've got a proof concluding in A equals B, then I sort of extend that proof by adding an F A uh, as an assumption and I get F B as a new conclusion or F B as an assumption and F A as a new conclusion. And if I want to specify that, going from a particular predication to a an arbitrary predication where p is now any predicate in the vocabulary, possibly even a complex predicate, which we'll see in, in a moment, then it generalizes as to holding for more predicates than just um, inferentially neutral ones. So how do you do this in general for arbitrary substitution? Well, a nice way to do this is to extend your vocabulary with um, lambda uh, terms so that any sentence can be uh, conceived of as a predication. Uh, any sentence with a, a formula in, uh, with a term inside it can be sort of uh, focused on as a, as a predication uh, of that form. And when you do this, uh, you get, and I'm not going to go through this in, in terms of time, but you can look at the details in the slides, you get here the obvious proof of symmetry, uh, where you know, it's, it's fairly hard work, it's sort of belabored here, obviously, you've got to go through the work to prove that A is identical to A, from the obvious assumptions that A facts transfer to A facts. And then, well, if A is identical to A, then A has got the feature of being identical to A, but if A is identical to B, then any, any feature of A can become a feature of B. So if you specify that uh, to the particular feature of being identical to A and cut the things together, uh, you get um, the obvious symmetry derivation. It seems like a hell of a lot of hard work to do it that way. Uh, so let's look at moving from the left right, uh, from the defining rules to you know, standard left right rules in the sequent calculus. Um, here, this is a, a left rule, oh, sorry, a right rule. And if I'm going to derive the left rules using exactly the same kind of algorithm, which is take an identity sequence, then uh, decompose uh, the, the introduced formula, the A is identical to B, into its components. In this case, it's the FA to FB transfer. So there's going to be another one for FB to FA. Then sort of specify that to any particular instance you want and then cut away all of the extra material, what you get is this version of the, the left rule where you've got an arbitrary sequence in the bottom and just the introduced concept A is identical to B and you get a left rule and you obviously get a right rule. And these are, you know, well understood left right rules for identity. When you look at them natural deduction wise, at least in the presence of contraction and weakening, I'll we'll do a little bit more work here because here the context X and Y are shared in both cases. And here there's a bunch of implicit sort of weakening and contraction going on in the background. You've got to do a bit more work to do. You know, Sarah Negri has got a nice paper on uh, natural deduction for intuitionist, um, uh, full intuitionist linear logic or multiplicative additive uh, linear logic where you can do stuff with um, shared contexts. So I'm not going to talk about that fancy footwork here. You know, you get this obvious uh, introduction rule for identity, which says if I can prove from FA to FB and I can prove from FB to FA, where the F is general, then I get that A is identical to B. And uh, here I can do the obvious um, uh, 
you know, identity elimination moves, both, uh, oh, this should have been a one. And uh, yes, that should be a one, uh, both from A to B and B to A. So it looks, it looks very standard. Um, and you can do the symmetry derivation in that introduction. It looks very nice. It's just, you know, focusing on that it's a predication. If you don't like the use of lambda terms, you could allow for, you know, arbitrary sentences with form with terms inside to be sort of honorary predications. If you like, there's no problem with that. I just like being honest about when something is a predication. And when you do this, you can spec is still height preserving admissible. You can eliminate cut uh, and you can get uh, a cut free calculus. And the result is, is horrible because uh, eliminating cut is hardly worth it because, you know, each of our rules breaks the sub formula properties six ways to Sunday. Uh, and it's hideous. Um, uh, you don't get analyticity. These rules aren't analytic. Okay, so you might think that this says that the defining rule kind of uh, methodology uh, gives you nicely well behaved things for the connectives and maybe the quantifiers, but when you're going to apply it to a predicate, uh, it seems to, you know, give you horrible results. Um, so we're going to need to look elsewhere for analytic rules. And this is a short section, and which is good because we're near the end. So I'm now going to explain how. Uh, these things relate to um, axioms uh, for identity. You know, uh, it's worth reflecting on this rule, which is a rule that almost nobody has proposed in a sequence calculus as being a rule to introduce identity. You know, nobody says that the way to prove that A is identical to B is to transport A facts to V facts and vice versa. I mean, this is clearly connected to, you know, the homotopy type theory and the understanding of the sort of semantics of identity. And there's something, you know, quite significant there. But if you look at, you know, first order sequence calculi for identity, nobody, you know, proposes a rule like this. And there's a good reason for that. It's that the obvious rule of reflexivity is actually interderivable with this um, in a very tight way. Because if we're in a position to transport A features to B, if I'm prepared to grant that being identical to A is an A feature, uh, then that's all I need. And the actual proof I have here, which gets me from FA to FB, or that derivation, which gets me from FA to FB, just apply that in the particular case where you've granted that A is identical to A, and that will become a proof that A is identical to B. So here we can replace this right rule by an axiom uh, in this case the reflexivity axiom, which just says, grant that, prove uh, that A is identical to A as it is. Then, uh, well, clearly this is no, this is given by the right rule. I can always prove that A is identical to A. On the other hand, if I've got the reflexivity rule, then whenever I want to apply the right rule, at this, uh, this spot in my proof, in my derivation, then take my derivation, which gets me from FA to FB, and instead, uh, in that derivation, because F is inferentially totally general, we've also got a derivation here. Uh, yeah, so F here is a predicate. If you like thinking of it as a second order variable, that's fine. I, I'm just responding to Anupam's uh, uh, question in the chat. Uh, you could think of it as a second order variable, if you like. It's just a general term. I'm not requiring that you think of it as a variable because we don't have to have the second order quantifiers if you don't want. Uh, you know, this is all purely first order, provided that the vocabulary has got some, you know, inferentially general, you know, predicates in there, if you like. Um, so sort of hideous terminology, but it's nowhere existent on Google yet. Uh, as far as I can tell, you could think of these as eigenpredicates, if you like, uh, in the same way that, you know, eigenvariables in a natural deduction system, are, you know, unbound uh, variables, which in one sense act just like names, uh, but they're names which play no significant role in the axioms or the rules. So if I've got my proof, from FA to FB, or my derivation from FA to FB, then everywhere substitute that with the particular predicate being identical to A. And I get this derivation because uh, specification is height preserving admissible. It's a derivation of exactly the same structure. It's just whenever I was doing F, I do this lambda term and then use reflexivity to get 
the assumption or to get the conclusion uh, that I indeed has the property of being identical to I and then do a cut and Bob's your uncle uh, with lambda elimination, a lambda on the right, you get that A is identical to B. And uh, that um, indeed uh, is, uh, a, tells you that we've got the same inferential power. It's just that uh, reflexivity is not a defining rule and it's not the kind of thing that you can do the inversion strategy with and it doesn't it's not a definition in the sense of an equivalence it's a hey it's a no take this claim to be true uh it's a little bit of harder work in one sense to deal with the left rule except it turns out that it's not if you look at the left rule it looks like cut except it looks like cut together with confusing a and b it's just a cut on the predication P of A or P of B or P of that thing. Uh, but we pay the extra price of uh, granting that A is identical to B. Well, a neat thing to do is that you can replace that with an axiom and you know shove these things all the way up to the leaves of our derivations. And if I grant these axioms uh, as axioms in the sequent calculus, uh, then I can recover, I, I can, these axioms certainly follow from the left rules in that way, but from these axioms and the particular instances of cut that I was sort of complaining about, you can derive the other left rules. So in the presence of cut, they're equivalent. A neat thing though, is that you can then notice that these are axioms and you think, well, they're still not very nice because these predicates, remember, could be complex. They could be sort of lambda term predicates. And so we've got a whole bunch of other logical vocabulary playing along the way. But then you realize that once we've got the axioms, a nice induction on the structure of the rest of the stuff shows that it can follow from just positing the axioms for the primitive predicates. And then the rest all follow in the same way that identity can actually only be can be granted just for atomic propositions and complex propositions followed by induction uh, uh, identity for identity sequence you know the uh, uh, followed by induction in exactly the same way uh, you can show for example that there's no need to grant uh, this for conjunctive properties if the uh, axiom holds for the conjuncts no need to hold for negative properties if it holds for the negands no need to hold for um, uh, quantified properties if it holds for the instances uh, in particular, uh, here's why we need both the left and the right rules. I mean, the, the uh, two directions of these rules because the polarity changing is enough for communication. Okay, in the final minutes, I'll talk about uh, what this means in natural deduction. Because it's kind of interesting. Uh, clearly, natural deduction, the reflexivity rule, looks very different from this rule, which involved, you know, assuming FA deriving FB, assuming FB deriving FA. It's just grant that as a proof. Uh, no need for any assumptions about that. That's true. But if you look at the 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 left axioms. They look exactly the same uh, as the sequent rules if they're, you know, occurring further down. It's just that when I do them as axioms, it's saying that when I'm thinking of this as being sort of built up by way of a sequent derivation, I'm just thinking of this as an atomic proof by itself, rather than where I'm adding it further down in the proof. It looks exactly the same uh, as the eliminations rule looked before, except we've been able to re uh, reduce it to uh, non-complex predicates. Okay, but once you've got these rules, just as axioms, uh, then we can do the standard cut elimination argument that we had before, all the way up to the axioms, because now we don't have any identity stuff going on below. So cut elimination and some form of the property and everything works all the way up to the axioms. Uh, except when I've got a cut on some axioms, I might get something which isn't an axiom. And so here I've got two instances of identity on the left. Uh, you know, if I cut here on the PB, I get this uh, sequence here, which isn't one of our axioms. And so if I want to eliminate cut completely, I need to grant a few more axioms here. I need to basically close these axioms under cut. Uh, what does that look like? Well, the general form of the axioms is, uh, you know, I can transfer from PA to PB, not only if I've got A is identical to B, or if you like B is identical to A, but if I've got any bunch of these um, identity statements, which together links A to B uh, in some chain. Um, and then uh, you can show that these things are closed under cut 
is a definition of that. And you can even get rid of a reflexivity axiom if you're happy for PI to not be there if it was uh, is identical to A, then all of the identity axioms have got this form. So what have I done? What we've done is we've looked at the relationship between a bunch of different formats for rules, uh, which I think I'm not going to say one of these is better than the other. They've got different kinds of properties. The rules which introduced identity by means of a defining rule, uh, that invertible rule here, has got the property that it's easy to show that the identity rule is uniquely defining, whereas the other rules by no means make that anywhere near so straightforward. And it's in one sense, norms which show how to introduce an identity as something that you prove in any context from any context, uh, but it's hard to show that it's conservative uh, using this. Then you can convert this to left and right rules by, by means of a straightforward translation, then spec is height preserving admissible, then you can eliminate cut in the usual way, but these left right rules don't have the same sub formula property, so that's a bit of a dead end. On the other hand, if you replace them with axioms, uh, then there's a very easy translation uh, between these and those. Uh, using cut, and now it's easier to uh, eliminate um, uh, cut, provided that you close these axioms themselves under cut, but then they've got a very natural uh, interpretation. But now we have something which looks very, very different about uh, the rules for identity, because now it's nothing like a defining rule, which says, imagine you had a vocabulary without this thing, here is how to add this to your vocabulary in terms of the other stuff. In so it doesn't look like a defining rule like this. What you get though, is something which is much more like a collection of semantic constraints concerning the primitive predicates of your vocabulary. So this, you know, treats identity kind of like a connective or a quantifier or something like that, where you're thinking of it as sort of composed from its constituents, but it's always gonna be weird thinking about identity in that way, because it's actually an atomic formula. Uh, it's just a predication of two terms. Uh, but you can do it that way if you like, but then it's interesting that you could think of this instead as a bunch of semantic constraints which connect the predicate of identity uh, towards all, to all of the other predicates in the vocabulary. And the thing that I've shown here is that these two presentations turn out to be inferentially, uh, inferentially equivalent. A derivation in one can be transformed into a derivation in the other, and so on. They're exactly the same kind of power of you know, intuitionist or classical logic. A little bit more work to do this in substructural settings. They're equivalent as far as derivability is concerned, but they're very different when it comes to sort of motivation and interpretation. So that's where I should stop.